Welcome back to another episode of Revenue Optimization. Brought to you by the good folks at Altify and hosted by their Chief Marketing Officer, Patrick Morrissey. Hey, Patrick. Good morning, Paul. How are you? I'm doing good today. I'm always anxious to see how we're going to optimize revenue. Wouldn't, wouldn't that be wonderful if we could do that every day here? Uh, well, you can if you have, you know, great, if you have everybody on the team playing ball, and that's really the conversation, you know, we're going to get into today. I am I'm very pleased to welcome Jay Shepard to the program because uh, Jay is, you know, both a executive coach, he runs a negotiation practice, but more importantly, he works with sales leaders and their teams to really develop world-class sellers. So, you know, I'd, I'd like to say uh, good morning, or I guess good afternoon to you, Jay. Welcome to Revenue Optimization Radio. Patrick, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you and your audience might be. Thanks for joining us. Give us a little bit of perspective on, on your background, because I've seen you in action in the big room, and I've also seen you, you know, do some one-on-one -on -one coaching that that is really changes the game for sales leaders and sales professionals. You know, give us a little bit of background on you and, you know, how you got here. I used to be the youngest guy in the room. Right. And then something happened, you know, now I'm like the older guy in the room. But let me think, I 34 years, 34 years in a variety of sales positions, sales management, leadership roles, primarily focused in technology. But I got to tell you, my love for sales and negotiation really started when I was in college. I, I was that typical broke college kid, Patrick, you know, who uh -huh. wasn't we've all been there. Earn, yeah, but not smart enough to earn scholarships. Right. So. I wanted a, a degree bad enough, so I started a t-shirt printing business. How's that? And that literally paid for most of my school. Nice. So, uh, you know, sales and uh, managing the bottom line, you know, you learned it early, and now you coach other people, you know, particularly large organizations on what does good look like in selling. And that's that's the conversation I want to get into today because my thesis would be that there's no sales leader that got up this morning, even in highly successful publicly traded global companies with, you know, millions or, or tens of millions or billions of dollars of quarterly revenue, who's not thinking in some way, shape, or form how do I improve my, you know, my team? How do I drive better performance across my sales team by association? You know, how's that going to help me win? And, you know, you've been at this for, you know, in various, you know, sales and sales leadership positions for a long time. You know, what would be your observation about, you know, the current state of play and, and what drives your passion around this entire topic about how do you, you know, level up the sales team to, to drive the right kind of outcomes? Well, you've got to certainly be open to change. And, you know, I learned a long time ago that Talk about passion, actually. Let's, I learned a long time ago that, you know, in many ways, it's just limited to a feeling. So it's, it's kind of difficult for someone to just wake up one, one day and, and become passionate about what he or she's been doing, you know, all their years at work. And I, you know, I, for me, I was really no different than probably most of your listeners. So at the, I don't know, at the risk of sounding a bit cliche, I think what drives my passion is that constant and that never ending improvement. In other words, that passion comes from, searching for the better. And I was really satisfied for long, and, and, and for that matter, too, as, as a result, I'm constantly finding ways uh, to build from what I learned. You know, i got to tell you, Patrick, I, I was always, uh, I always tell my friends and, and uh, those I'm close to, I say, I always joke that my drive for passion first emerged when I was like five. You know, too many of my toys were taken, taken away, I guess, from my, uh, for me in my sandbox. And so, you know, I guess I learned as a little guy, you have to create your own happiness. It's, it's your responsibility. It's no one else's. So it drives my passion. Well, it's that happiness, the gratitude, and that flat-out ego boost you receive by knowing you made an impact uh, in, in your situation or with someone else. Yeah, and impact, I think, is the optimal word there in that statement that really drives the, the discussion today because – I want to talk about how do you get to be what, what you, I've heard you call a level three seller. That's interesting to me for a couple of reasons, starting with the idea that if you were going to talk to most sales professionals who've had, you know, five, 10, 15 plus years sales experience and you ask them how good they are at sales, generally people are going to have a pretty strong, positive personal impression about their skill and their capability. And, you know, when you apply your framework to it, that often is exposed as, you know, not the case and, and in many cases, much less than good. So give me a little context about what is a level three seller or maybe, you know, start to delineate level one, level two, level three and, and what this path looks like to get to being a high performance, you know, strategic seller. You know, Patrick, it wasn't too long ago that if you ever got fired in your job, just go and get a job in sales. 
right? <laughs> they're, they're there. <laughs> yes. Here's, here's, what, here's what's fascinating. Salespeople are not being hired today, and that's what I, I think is so important that we understand. And the reason salespeople, and when I say salespeople, it, it can mean a lot of different things. I'll go into this whole level one, two, three piece in a minute. But salespeople aren't being hired because of the degraded value that they bring today versus what the demands of the customer are, are clearly, clearly asking. I mean, think about the routes to market, for example. If you're if you're selling something that takes multiple sales calls, multiple people, multiple resources, that's a high level expense, right? Today, sellers are selling through multiple channels, maybe a partner or distributor model, maybe uh, through telesales or inside sales. But then you also have this thing called the internet. And the internet has taken those transactional sellers in particular and, and really wiped out that role in, in many cases or certainly reduced it in a significant way. So when I talk about level one, two, and three, it means a lot of different things. So if you don't mind, let me just kind of level set this. So yes, please. Level one, two, yeah, so level one, two, and three, what it refers to is the, uh, the personal and the business value you as a seller provide uh, as defined by the client at all levels of the organization you're calling on. It's subtle. It's obvious. It's your reputation according to others. Well, it's who you are, it's, and it's what you've earned based on your actions with the client and the prospect. It can also be heavily influenced by the company's uh, approach that you sell for, the company's approach to business, maybe even the industry that you work for uh, and or the actions of all of your colleagues. But with level one, two, and three, it's, it's important to note that each level provides its own set of value, and it's fully appropriate and effective in certain situations. The best sellers are those that can operate at all three levels. So let me kind of break down what I mean by level one, two, and three. By okay. definition... If you are a level one seller, your value is defined by the products and the solutions that you represent. Again, it's a good thing. When we start with a new job, for example, and, and the company, the selling company hires you, what do they do, Patrick? They, the first thing they do is they train you, and what do they train you on? Products and, and solutions, right? So what happens Absolutely. often is sellers will go into a, into a sales environment knowing their products and solutions comfortably because of good training. But here's what happens. There's a decision that is made. Let's say you stay with this company long term and you've had some success selling your products and your solutions. Well, what happens so often is you level off. I mean, no one's looking at you. You're hitting your numbers. And in the eyes of the client, you are a product and solution uh, sales specialist. Again, nothing, nothing wrong with that at all. But the challenge you have, though, is how far you can get within an organization. If the only value you are bringing is your product or your solution, right? Because you're going to be viewed in the eyes of the client as a, as a vendor or maybe a credible source. In other words, one of the better vendors that are out there. And you're going to be limited in your access, maybe to operations or, or certainly not the business side of the company. And you know what, Patrick, from my viewpoint, I've, gosh, I've worked with thousand plus organizations in the last 30 years. 70% of sellers fall into this category. Again, not a bad place to be if that's the way and the only way to sell in your market. I'm just going to tell you, and I think your experience is probably the same, there's other ways to sell, and the demands of the client are, are such that they're asking for different levels of interaction and value that the seller can bring. And that's where level two and level three come into play. So level yeah, two, and, uh, and let me uh, let me just ask, um, give me yeah. some context in terms of that step up because to your point, Jade, I was talking to you know a prospect uh, earlier this year and they had approximately seventy percent market share in their market, but the market is starting to go away. It, you know, starting to trickle off because of advancements in technology. And what they found is that they didn't really have any sort of relationship with anybody in the business above the manager level. They'd been selling the same thing in the same way for literally decades and owned the market largely. And now as the ground is shifted under them, they find themselves completely ill-prepared to take any kind of action in part because they just don't know anybody in the business. Yeah, Patrick, boy, there you go. You, we pigeonhole ourselves into building value around our products and our solutions. And then when you have a major shift like you just described, well, you're in trouble or you could potentially be in trouble if you don't move and move quickly and, and start to look at how you interact with a client in a more strategic way. And, and that's where level two and level three come into play. Do you want me to walk you through those? Yes, please. Yeah, so level two kind of moves you to, actually to the point you're bringing up now is it kind of moves you from that vendor status to being more of a, a problem solver is probably a better way to describe it. It's Again, this is all defined by the client, but how does your client 
define you. I mean, in, in level two and level one, it's a great example to ask your question, you know, ask a question of, you know, who are you compared to? So think about the other sellers, the other companies you compete with. You're being compared to them. Are they mainly level one or maybe they're this level two, right? Where level two is all about being a problem solver, but being beyond the product and solution itself. It's where you're able to articulate TCO or, or total cost of ownership or maybe articulate a return on investment uh, based on uh, that return uh, access and and, uh, and and the ability to, to connect with agendas and, and what it does to the other parts of the business. I mean, 20% of sellers that I see fall into this level two category. And then finally, just, just to finish it out, level three, this is kind of that exponential uh, combination, if you would, that, that quantum leap of level one and two combined. This is where the game changer starts to play. This is what I would consider 10% of sellers falling into this category. Uh, you've heard that overused term, trusted advisor. Clearly, you're a trusted advisor, and you can routinely access those well, those executive ranks in the organization because of the value that you bring. In fact, the value says so much they can't even remember what company you work for. You know, you're a you're a political player, uh, a trusted advisor, a key lieutenant. I mean, there's a lot of terms you can use. You influence what we call alternative uses of capital. So think of it this way: here's an executive; they have X amount of money that he or she is going to invest in based on the business drivers, the pressures uh, that they are facing. What a level three seller can do is they can talk to that executive and say, here's why you want to consider going down this direction. In other words, they can influence this alternative use of capital. As I said, price doesn't so much disappear. It just diminishes in, in significance. And as I said, 10% uh, 10 fall into that category. Yeah, and I think that's really getting to to what good looks like, and I think that's the aspiration a lot of people have. And it, uh, just as a sideline, I was reading something the other day, the net of which was in what you just encapsulated is why you know Bant is not a good qualification criteria, because if you really understand the client, you understand the business, and you're seen as that that partner in crime, that trusted expert, that you know strategic. Uh, resource for the executives on the team. It's never about budget, and it may not even be about a defined project. It's about you're helping me solve a problem, and I'm going to make resources available to make that happen. You know, Patrick, with that example you just gave, you know, it's never about budget. Who comes up with the budget anyway? Where do they come up with this number? And you know, that level three person is the one that's going to uh, really uh, help define that. I, I would say it this way: level three sellers, they're the ones that write the RFP. It's the level one person who jumps up and down because they finally have a chance to get into that company, right? Not realizing it was their competitor, the level three that actually wrote the RFP. Yeah, exactly. We could do a whole dialogue about, you know, how RFPs are just a complete, you know, waste of time for everybody who wasn't part of the writing team. And it's amazing how many people still think that that's a, that's a good use of sales time. But let's let's hold that thought for a second while we, you know, break and pay a couple of bills. And when we come back, I want you to give me a little bit more color and some examples and, and delineate between level two and level three. So let's pay the bills. We'll be right back. You're only successful as your customers, and that demands the need for an exceptional sales execution, revenue retention, and customer success. The challenge for most sales leaders and their teams, however, is that their sales process just doesn't match how their customers buy. Sustained growth isn't possible because the revenue team isn't aligned with customers and prospects. With Altify's sales transformation solutions, companies can deliver predictable revenue growth. Yes, we said predictable revenue growth. They can also acquire and retain customers, and they can collaborate across the revenue team to qualify and win new business while delivering value that unlocks cross-sell and upsell opportunities. Built natively on the Salesforce platform, Altify helps salespeople, managers, and executives achieve sustained revenue growth. They help accelerate sales performance for Autodesk, Comcast, GE, Honeywell, Salesforce, Tableau, and United Healthcare. They can do the same for you. Visit Altify.com, just like it sounds, A-L-T-I-F-Y, Altify.com. All right, let's pick it back up with uh, Patrick and his guest. And before you do, i got to say our board lit up. There was a lot of thumbs up and attaboys when you said RFPs can be a giant waste of time for the team involved here. I've certainly experienced that. 
Yeah, I have a whole complete theory on RFPs, Paul, which is they exist primarily to keep people, you know, in desk jobs, you know, trying to produce value <laughs> and wasting a lot of vendors' time. So yeah, right. that that's probably a whole different show unto itself. I'd love to see that show because too often I think they're just getting proposals to make themselves look good here. I'm not sure that they really uh, lead to a lot of effort goes into an awful lot of wasted energy here. Oh yeah, um, absolutely. But but I want to come back to talking talking about you know building a, a team of strategic sellers. We're talking to Jay Shepard today, and Jay is an executive coach, a sales leadership you know coach and trainer. He's also an expert in and does uh, has a whole body of work around negotiation. And when we we jumped off, Jay, you had just laid out the framework between you know level two and level three, and we were talking about um, how to get to how to get to capital and how to get on the agenda. But give me a little bit more color on you know the the difference between level two and level three, that top thirty percent, and what is what are the characteristics in your mind of a great seller? What does good look like when if you were going to sketch out the the diagram of a best in class you know strategic seller selling into a complex market? Man, those those are some heavy questions. How much time do we have, Patrick? <laughs> Not more than five minutes, Jay. Ah, uh, man. Okay. Well, let me let me give it my best shot. So, level two sellers they they tend to be more operationally um, strategic. Uh, they they have somewhat of a of a broader focus. Uh, I call them kind of that. They're not a gunslinger by any means, but what they are is someone that will take the bull by the horns and, and, and absolutely do what they can to take control of the situation. Level three people, they tend to operate a little bit better in more of a political environment. Uh, they, they take direction for the most senior levels of the organization. So, you know, as I lay these out, I'm, I'm hoping your listeners are saying, hey, that's me, right? Or here is here's where I am today, but boy, I'd like to be level three. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But really what they do is, is level three is they, they understand agendas and they help achieve that individual senior leader's agenda. Uh, they understand the politics. They understand conflict. They, they get the, high, the whole idea of what drives uh, people to make decisions. They understand pressures, consequences of inaction. You know, they kind of look at uh, relationships not as a, as a uh, I'm trying to sell you something, but more of a kind of a partnership, a mutually beneficial, I don't know, one plus one equals three partnership. So those are a couple of things that kind of come to mind. Now, the characteristics, I mean, there's so much that's out there now, Patrick, you know, from, gosh, challenger sale to, you know, there's some great books out there on value selling. And, you know, I, I can give you what my perspective is on this, but just know that there's, there's some really good, um, there's some really good content that's out there, I think, from, from various research reports. And, you know, I, I look at a level three seller as one that's, I don't know, they, they have a kind of a unique perspective of, of the world and specifically of the client. And they understand the client's business, not just you know, here's what they sell and, you know, here's who they sell to, but they understand the inner workings of the industry, the markets that they sell. They understand the competitive threats. Uh, they understand that the clients that they sell to actually compare themselves to others in the marketplace. I would use the example of, look, sadly, you know, here's Sears Holdings, right? And their, their financials, uh, you know, because the company's in bankruptcy. You know, tell me Sears doesn't compare themselves to Walmart, to Amazon, to, you know, to Target and what have you, right? That's a, that's what a level three seller does. They understand who the customer they're calling on, who those executives compare themselves to, and then they wrap solutions around helping to relieve some of that pressure. So there's just a couple of top of mind thoughts anyway. Yeah, and, and I want to go back to a point you raised earlier about you know generating impact. It's one thing to understand you know the the politics or some of the priorities. It's another thing to be able to to you know f frame a solution in in terms of the customer's language, the customer's outcomes, you know the customer's uh, expectations in terms of value, how they deliver value. And you also raised the the point that fundamentally, whether it's your direct competition or maybe more broadly, it's everybody else who's calling on the same account you're calling at, you're being compared to all of those people who are fighting for mindshare, fighting for dollars. So how do you break through the barrier or what what suggestions would you give to try to, particularly for a lot of people who are more advanced in this conversation, trying to get to a level three you know, level of, of sales skill and, and execution? I can only look at my own career too. And in and, and those 30 plus years, gosh, it still is painful for me to say that, those, those 30 plus years, you know, I have essentially arrived where I am today through, gosh, mistakes, perspective, awareness, you know, uh, almost to a point of recognizing unconscious, you know, what I'm competent at, what I'm not, and then really eventually becoming unconsciously competent, as they call it, right? 
So I think one of the first ways you can go from, let's say, level one to two or level two to three, wherever you may be, first of all, it's okay. Recognize that right off that. It's okay to be where you are. But if, if you want to make a change, what you need to do is, is recognize what you do not do well in that just naturally may not come to you or you just perspective isn't there and, and make a, uh, a concerted effort to, to improve. So how do you do that? Well, I, for me anyway, I had to ask myself, you know, what, uh, what, what way am I motivated? Am I, am I tactically driven? Am I guided by uh, client strategic vision? Can I anticipate threats, not only to me, but to my own client? Uh, this is about changing, uh, then controlling a conversation. And so it's, it's kind of being proactive. And so move from that reactive mode to being more responsive and proactive. I mean, those are some really good characteristics as well of being level three. Politics. Boy, pa Patrick, you and I both know this, right? Patrick, when it comes to politics, I mean, politics is everywhere. You, we look at the executive branch, we look at Congress, we look at all of that, but gosh, there's politics in your local school board, in your local bingo parlor, if you wanted to make it, uh, you know, really complex, right? There is a comp uh, politics, excuse me, are everywhere. So understand and be aware first of politics in the client organization you're calling on, then start to learn how to be agile. And, and then eventually what we call politically astute. In other words, you're so strong politically, you know what you can, uh, what pond uh, of water you can dip your toe in and what you can't. And uh, eventually you'll, you'll earn that, that moniker of being politically astute. And then finally, here's, you know, here's one of the things that I see more than anything else as it relates to a level one seller. And, and, you know, I don't know about your perspective on this, but level one sellers tend to use the resources, those very rare resources that clients have that are available to their entire sales organization. They use them prematurely or uh, excessively. And I, I think a good level three seller is one that can use those resources in a timely and judicious manner as well to have the greatest impact. So anyway, there's a couple of top of mind thoughts anyway. Uh, is that helpful? It is. But in your, your point about resources is interesting, too, because I would make that same observation in terms of resource utilization, both on the client side as well as, you know, internally in the business. That, you know, my observation is that the top sellers that I've seen through my career generally do a good job of, um, you know, quarterbacking the team to use a, a little bit of a tired analogy, but they're judicious with their asks, both in terms of the client and, but also in terms of the internal, all the members of the revenue team that they've got to get involved to really surround the client and, and help them deliver, you know, the right kind of solution, the right kind of value, the right kind of outcomes for their business. That's a solid point. And, you know, we, here we're talking about level one, two, and three in the eyes of the client. We've got to also think in the eyes of our own companies that we work for. What is your reputation? I mean, where do you fall? And this resources point you're bringing up there is a great example of where probably first to look. Well, it, it is, too. And it, it's interesting because we had done some some research. And one of the questions we had asked at Altify was, you know, talk about the relationship and do sales and marketing work well together. And as you might expect, they generally gave themselves reasonably high marks, uh, the marketing guys a little bit more than the, the sales team. But when you ask that same question about the, the sales marketing relationship to the rest of the revenue team, you know, finance, ops, you know, G&A, et cetera, the answer that they came back with was, well, only about 50 percent of the time in our companies. You know, it's all the other people on the team that are really the different one of the differences, I would argue, between what you're pointing to in terms of level two versus, you know, level three seller. And I think that there's a lot of uh, great opportunity for all of us. Uh, as I said at the top, I don't think there's anybody who got up this morning in a in a real professional sales leader uh, or even professional seller mode who isn't thinking in some way, shape or form about how do I execute better? How do I how do I perform better? Um, how do I learn more? So when you think about your career and, and the clients and the folks you've worked with and worked for, Jay, who would you point to as best in class or what? Give me an example of one of the best, you know, you know, revenue or sales leaders you've ever you know, worked for, or worked with. And what did you learn from them? Let me think. I mean, I've had a wide variety of experiences with cultures and, and really experienced individuals at both ends of the spectrum, that best and worst. And, you know, you can learn from that, too. Right. So, um, hmm. I would I would say that that the best sales and revenue leader I've worked for is probably one that was able to build a culture, uh, a, a culture that was around exceptional customer driven excellence, right? But 
but they believed in in something more than that. They believed in the operational element, the the efficiencies, taking technology, whatever your CRM platform might be, and truly utilizing it versus being a, a data repository, but actually get that data to work for you. And so I see that so often is these CRM platforms, for example, they're, they're just, they're so underutilized. So you look at efficiencies. I, I saw, I saw sales leaders and worked for sales leaders that were able to bring those efficiencies out and then drive better sales effectiveness culture. Gosh, they were, they were really good at defining what success was, but patient enough to train you and teach you and, and give you, um, those experiences that you can learn along the way to become level one to level two, level two to level three. And then finally, they're really good at communicating a vision and that you could buy into it. Those are just a couple thoughts anyway. Those are great thoughts. And I, and I, going back to level one, level two, level three, one of the, the points that you made I think is critical here is, hey, level one is okay for a lot of circumstances and a lot of type of selling. So it's not that, you know, everybody on the planet, you know, wants to or even needs to become a level three seller. But, right. you know, it, it's different in every single market and, and in every single, you know, area. But it comes down to can you generate an impact for your clients? And and as I said before, I think there's a lot of organizations really struggling with this, Jay, and, and really looking for help to, to understand what good looks like and how do they up-level their, their entire, you know, sales team from level one to level two, level two to level three, and, and build skills in small ways. So if... If people wanted to reach out to you, what's the best way to, you know, get in touch with you, you know, get in contact and tap into your expertise? You know, I would say go, go LinkedIn. I'm Jay Shepard, Achieve ROI. Uh, and, and I've got a, I've got a, um, a presence there. And, you know, it's really interesting because, you know, a lot of people say, well, set up a website, set up, a, you know what? I, I don't want to get too big too fast. And I'll tell you why. Uh, you, you start to lose the intimacy, the, the effectiveness. And so I, I, I'm at a situation and, and an opportunity at this point where I'm able to work with a handful of clients at a time and, and get very intimate with them to ensure that they are always being driven. So check me out on LinkedIn. Um, I've got a, I've got a, uh, uh, all my contact information there as well. Excellent. Well, Jay, I really appreciate the time this morning. Um, I appreciate the insight as well. And I would encourage all of you to, to contact Jay or to contact us at, at Altify if you need some more help in terms of trying to help raise the bar on sales performance and drive the, the next level of strategic selling from level one, level two, level three. So, Jay, thanks for sharing your insight today. You know, good luck um, you know, moving the market and let's catch up soon. Good to connect, Patrick. Thanks. You bet. Thank you. <laughs> You've been listening to another episode of Revenue Optimization right here on Funnel Radio Network for at-work listeners like you.